Um, good morning. Happy Monday for those of you in the U.S. Happy 4th of July weekend. Thank you for taking time out of your holiday to join us um, here today on July 3rd. First up, we have Stephen Kane, Professor of Planetary Astrophysics at the University of California. He will be speaking on understanding planetary habitability. Dr. Kane, you have the floor. All right, thank you very much. I'll just go ahead and share my screen. All right, and how's that? Can you see it full Looks screen? Yep, looks Excellent. great. All right, great. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, and hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us today in, in um, my presentation, talking briefly about understanding planetary habitability. Now, uh, as I'm going to make clearer over the next half hour, this is a, a very large, broad topic. Uh, it's very nuanced. There's many interdependencies that we're going to talk about. Uh, so uh, my hope today is just to give you an overview of how broad it is, some of the questions that come up about planetary habitability, some questions that I hope will inspire you to think about uh, the various aspects of planets that make them uh, a, a habitable environment. Uh, so I'm starting out with this slide showing uh, three of the main terrestrial bodies within our planetary system uh, that have atmospheres. There's a, uh, I would actually add a fourth here, which is, of course, Titan, Saturn's moon, uh, particularly as that has an atmosphere which is 50% more massive than Earth's. But when you combine these four together, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Titan, then we're talking about essentially the entire terrestrial atmospheric inventory of our solar system. And a lot of what we've learned about planetary habitability has come from studying these kinds of objects. So let's just dive right in and start thinking about this, this whole topic. Um, so first of all, the, the major question, what is planetary habitability? And that is, uh, <laughs> that even on its own is a difficult question to answer because there are many different directions that you can go with this, depending on how Earth or, or, or Terra-based that you want to make this topic. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but there are, there are various ecological arguments you could make for planetary habitability. And, and I'm gonna be focusing more on a planetary, uh, planetary science, planetary environment aspect of it, because the way in which I define it is that it's fundamentally a, an, an assessment of the energy balance at a planetary surface. And I'll explain why the energy balance uh, is important. That means the incoming energy and the outgoing energy from a planet. And so if you define it in that way, then you can start to talk about, well, what is controlling that? What are the various pieces that are influencing uh, this habitable environment? And, uh, and which of those are most important and which of those are least important? Because as we're going to see, there are many, many factors which can influence this energy balance. And uh, a lot of it is about trying to rank them from top to bottom, most important to least important, or perhaps a better way of putting that is uh, more subtle uh, in their contributions. So a lot of the discussion is about, well, how do we measure these various factors? What can we do with these measurements? And at the end of the day, when we're talking about planetary habitability, uh, it has to be applicable to a very broad range of objects, which is, of course, a huge part of the challenge. Uh, having, you know, kind of a one size fits all construct of what makes uh, uh, planetary habitability work. And so when we have this discussion, uh, it's something that we have to be aware of is our anthropic bias. And this, this is a very broad 
topic on its own that I could spend many hours talking about, the anthropic bias. And there's another more general principle to do with the universe, which is the anthropic principle, that being that the fundamental constants and the universe is uh, constructed in a way that that allows life to actually observe it. But, but more specifically, when we're talking about habitability, where we always think of Earth, because that, to our knowledge, is the uh, only habitable environment that we know of, or at least the only one that has life that that we know for sure we could we could talk about things like water present under the under the surface of Europa or think th things like that other possible locations of life in our solar system but so far we only know of one location that is earth and that it uh, has a lot of features to do with it and the thing that we need to be careful about is not anchoring ourselves to earth too much there there are many specific features of earth that we're going to look at uh, that and life is here, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the that those two are correlated in all cases. So we'll be looking at at, at some of these uh, some of these situations. I want to mention I wrote I recently wrote a book on on the topic. This sounds like a complete shill of me trying to sell my book. I'm not actually. Uh, uh, in, in fact, I would prefer it if you don't buy it because it's quite expensive. And if, and many of you may have access to it already because it's published through IOP Publishing um, and uh, and is often freely available on the website. If you have any trouble getting access to it, then send me a message and I'll be happy to uh, have you uh, get access to it. So I wanted to quickly mention one of my favorite board games is terraforming Mars. And um, one of the reasons I mention that here is because it's a very, very clever game in which we're trying to turn Mars into a habitable planet. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, research cards that you can play that change the Martian in environment. And um, one of the things that you're, oh, you're trying to do several things. One is to raise the oxygen level. You're trying to raise the temperature, but you're also trying to add liquid water. And this is an interesting aspect of planetary habitability that comes up all the time. In fact, generally the way in which we define planetary habitability is trying to create conditions under which water can exist in a liquid state on the surface of the planet. And so I want to spend a few moments talking about the importance of water in a liquid state, why that is important and why that can be used as a reasonable metric uh, from which we can go about constructing a framework of planetary habitability. But, um, but if you haven't played this game already, I highly recommend it. It's July 4th weekend here in the United States and um, uh, I'm going to be doing some of this uh, this weekend, possibly right after giving this talk. So, um, so let's talk about liquid water. Why, why does uh, uh, it, does this always come up, even in these games and and other locations? The importance of water, because this goes back to the anthropic bias. Okay, so we need to be careful. Um, Seventy percent of Earth's surface is covered with liquid water oceans. Uh, so this is something which has been very important for Earth. And when we do think of a planet that uh, that is potentially habitable, we do tend to as associate it with uh, liquid water. So is this a bias? Is this uh, misleading us? And in this case, uh, I would argue that this is actually a fair connection. And there's several reasons why. And I've listed three things here, and, and you, you might even be able to come up with some reasons of your own, and there certainly are other, other reasons. But here are a couple of reasons why liquid water is extremely important. First of all, the components of water, hydrogen and oxygen, are extremely common. Uh, we see this to, throughout our observations of the universe. We detect the, the absorption features of water uh, certainly uh, many places outside of our solar system, but even inside of our solar system, water is extremely abundant. And uh, it's, it's interesting when you look at our solar system, we, uh, like I said, when we think of liquid water, we think of earth and oceans and things like that. But the inner part of our solar system is actually relatively dry compared to the outer part of our solar system. Uh, there is tons and tons of water uh, not necessarily in a liquid state, a lot of it's locked up in ice, but there is a lot of 
water uh, in icy forms beyond the orbit of Mars. Our solar system has an abundance of it. Uh, so that's a good thing to have, to have water be uh, so common. The second reason is that water is a, a neutral solvent and there are a fairly, a fairly limited subset of compounds where if you have them in a liquid state, then they are a neutral solvent in which you can have uh, all kinds of chemical reactions. And in the context of life and habitability, we're most interested in biochemical reactions. And so we want to have that place where you can have that starting point for life and certainly the evolution of life. And thirdly, and, and this is quite a key one, is that water is in a liquid state at reasonably high temperatures. And so when we think of alternatives to water, maybe you think of things like ethane and, and other hydrogen compounds, and uh, those tend to be in a liquid state at very cold temperatures. Uh, so there are alternatives to water, but they're less common and they're in a liquid state at much colder temperatures. And the reason that that may be uh, something that you don't prefer is because that slows down the chemical reactions. And so if it, water is great because reasonably high temperatures where you're going to promote the biochemistry and have those evolutionary processes uh, take place faster. And so those are just a couple of the reasons why we love liquid water. And so if you now state, okay, then in order to consider planetary habitability, let's consider planets that have liquid water on the surface. And if you do that, then that's very interesting because you're, you're creating a framework that limits the temperature at the planetary surface to a very specific range. At one atmospheric pressure, it's between zero and 100 degrees Celsius, right? So that's, and so once you have a temperature range, then you can try and understand the physics of what's going on that would control that temperature range. And as I mentioned at the start of this talk, there are a huge number of, of, uh, of factors that can influence surface liquid water. So if we start in the center, our requirement is we want water in a liquid state at the surface. When you can ask, well, okay, so what's influencing that? And we can divide it into three main categories. First of all, um, uh, by the way, can you, can you see my cursor? Yes. Great, perfect, okay. So uh, in the top left here, you can see it says stellar effects. And I'll, I'll talk more about the star in a moment. But the, the star that the planet is orbiting has a profound effect on the planetary habitability. There's all kinds of uh, various pieces related to the star that's going to influence that. Uh, then down the bottom here, you've got the properties of the planet, which are obviously very important. You've, you've got the, the, the surface of the planet, the atmosphere of the planet is gonna be extremely important. Uh, and then in the top right, we can see it says planetary system. And so planetary system means that the planet usually isn't alone, certainly as is the case in our solar system, there are other planets there, sometimes giant planets. And these can affect the planet that you're interested in, in very interesting ways. Now, uh, this is a, a, a very simplistic version of thinking about this. And so we can, we can go deep, deep down this rabbit hole. And, uh, and when you start connecting various pieces to what I just showed you, then you can start to separate out individual components that you can look at in detail. So for example, when we're looking at the properties of the planet, you see the properties of the planet here, we've got the mass of the planet, we've got the radius of the planet. These are the kinds of things that we can easily measure, but there are other things which are much more difficult to measure. For example, if we go down here to the bottom right where it says interior and you've got the internal evolution, magnetic field, these are things, or some of these things are, are even poorly understood for the earth. Uh, and so they can be much more difficult to determine for other planets. And like I said at the beginning, a lot of the challenge is to understand uh, which of these are the most important and which of these contribute the least to this thing at the center, the presence of 
surface liquid water. And so what I'm going to do, because I have very limited time, obviously this is, this is a very complicated diagram. You'll see that there's dashed lines showing how two pieces can depend on each other. And this is a diagram which has a nickname, planets are hard. <laughs> and ironically, uh, from, from my research into this topic, this, this diagram is actually an extremely simplistic uh, representation of the problem. You can, you can continue down the rabbit hole to extraordinary depths. And so what I'm going to do for the my remainder of my time is just talk about a couple of these, uh, of these features from each of these three categories, the stellar effects, planetary system, and the planetary properties. And uh, like I said, I'll, hopefully I'll give you some, some questions for you to think about in how these are contributing to planetary habitability. So let's start with the star, uh, because uh, like I said, planetary habitability is really about the energy balance, the energy input and the energy output. That's what's really controlling the temperature that's occurring at the surface, along with many other things. But um, uh, the major contributor to that energy balance is the star that it's orbiting. The star is overwhelmingly the, the uh, major contributor um, to a, a planetary climate energy budget. Uh, there is some energy so sometimes received from the planet itself as it's cooling because energy, uh, planets are radiating energy from their surface, from their, for their interior heat. But for, for the most part, that is much, much smaller than the energy being received at the top of the atmosphere. And so stars are very, very important. There's a huge range of stars. Uh, we orbit uh, what is sometimes called a fairly average star, average in terms of its, uh, in terms of its size and its mass, uh, not necessarily average in terms of how common it is because uh, smaller stars are much more common than the sun, but there are different kinds of stars. Uh, they have different temperatures, which is going to have a huge effect on the amount of energy received by the planet. And the temperature uh, is often to first order represented by its color. So when you, that's why when you look at images like this, you can see all these different colors. But I just wanted to mention a few important things about stars, uh, because like I said, there's all different kinds of stars and we orbit this kind of star, a G star, you can see that the surface temperature of, of the star is about 5,700 degrees Kelvin. And the interesting thing about these stars is that they live different amounts of time. So you can see that there's a row here, which says lifetime. And this lifetime is measured in millions of years. And so when we look at a star like our sun, it says 10,000, 10,000 million, which is 10 billion. So 10 billion years is the part of the sun's life when it will be burning hydrogen. And so that's a long time. And we're about halfway through that. The, the age of our solar system is about four and a half billion years. So we're not even halfway, plenty of time left. But what about a smaller star? Well, smaller stars can live very long. This is 200,000, which means 200 billion. That's longer than the current known age of the universe, which is about 15 billion years. And so, uh, so small stars live a very long time. That's great. But massive stars only live about 10 million years. 10 million years is not long enough for planets to progress along in their own planetary evolution, certainly uh, not long enough for biological evolution to be occurring to any significant amount. So, so you could say that massive stars are, even though they produce loads of energy, which might be good, that is a very bad thing, uh, that they don't live very long. On the other hand, small stars can have problems of their own. Uh, because small stars produce a lot of flares. They tend to be very active. You might know that the, the, the sun goes through occasional periods of high solar activity, and solar activity uh, can affect satellite networks, but they can also uh, change the planet in profound ways because solar activity means that there, there's a lot more flares and that can uh, affect the atmosphere and it can remove parts of the atmosphere. Not to anything uh, significant that we would notice on Earth. But for small stars, it can be a huge effect. And so small stars have a lot of problems of their own. And we'll come back to that 
again in a moment. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to mention about stars to keep in mind is that during their lifetime, they change as well. And so if we look at the case of the sun, the sun is increasing in brightness. And so uh, the, the sun uh, was about 30% less bright at the beginning of our solar system formation. And so what you can see here, that if you pay attention to the red line, that uh, about 4 billion years ago, the sun was about 30% less luminous. And as the sun continues to age, it's going to become more luminous. And that means that more energy received at the top of the atmosphere. And so the energy budget of our planet is going to change whilst the sun continues to increase in brightness. And so the question is, is since the star is changing with time, how does the planet change in response to that? And so this then raises another important piece of planetary habitability, how the physics and the chemistry of a planet is, is changing to cope with this change in the energy budget. And for, for Earth, Earth is able to do this in a very efficient way because uh, the Earth is able to actually remove carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, as you may know, is a very efficient greenhouse warming gas. And so the, the good news is that carbon dioxide dissolves into our oceans and dissolves into precipitation. It turns into carbonate rocks, which make their way to the seafloor. And then there is this process that you may have heard of called plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is where you have two uh, plates, one which is moving underneath the other. And as a result of that, the carbon from the atmosphere is essentially being sequestered and moved into the Earth's interior. It doesn't stay there. Eventually, it comes back out through uh, volcanoes. Uh, but we have this cycle, and this cycle is removing the carbon from the Earth's atmosphere. And the interesting thing is that this is happening in a temperature-dependent way. That means as, as the temperature increases, the efficiency of removing the carbon from the atmosphere also increases. And so the Earth's atmosphere is able to respond to this. This is extraordinary because like I said, the trick to planetary habitability is to be able to maintain the surface temperature between zero and 100 degrees Celsius at one atmospheric pressure and to be able to do that for a long time. And the Earth has had surface liquid water for almost all of its history. So that means that the Earth has maintained a narrow temperature range for more than 4 billion years, and that is extraordinary. How does it do this? Well, there are several con contributing factors. One of them, we suspect, is this ability to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So this is obviously a very important feature. So that's an important feature of the planet itself. Now I wanted to tell you about something which is an important part of the planetary system. One of the uh, amazing features of our planetary system that I don't know if you ever think about that much, particularly in the context of planetary habitability, is that we have four giant planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And uh, having these four giant planets has had a very amazing effect on our planetary system. One of the ways you can state this is that Jupiter on its own is more massive than all the other planets combined. So that means that Jupiter is by far the dominant planetary mass in our solar system. That means it has an enormous gravitational influence. It has changed the orbits of the other planets through time. And it has also acted as a distributor of material throughout the solar system and sometimes an absorber of material. And one of the ways in which we see this is impacts. And so back in, uh, I want to say 1994, I was an undergraduate at the time when a comet named Shoemaker-Levy uh, impacted Jupiter and the Hubble Space Telescope, which hadn't been launched for very long at that time, was pointed at it along with 
most of the most of Earth's telescopes. And we observe these extraordinary impacts as a comet hit Jupiter. Now, the, the question is, if it hadn't hit Jupiter, what would have happened to it? It was on an Earth crossing orbit. Maybe it would have hit Earth eventually. Maybe not. Um, but one of the factors that people think about when it comes to giant planets is are giant planets uh, mechanisms through which we can absorb impacts that would otherwise cause extinction level events and profoundly change the atmosphere if it's a really significant uh, impact? Um, it, it, if you don't have giant planets, then does that mean that planets in those systems are suffering enormous amount of impacts? Possibly. Possibly that's the case. Uh, it, it depends on the giant planet and the orbit that it's in. But if this is an important factor, then it might mean that, uh, that Earth-like planets, meaning potentially habitable planets, are restricted to those systems that have planets like Jupiter. And that's important because we now know that other planetary systems, giant, uh, giant planets like Jupiter are actually pretty rare, meaning having a planet like Jupiter at a distance far from the star where it could absorb these impacts. And it's a rare at about the 10% level. Only 10% of known star systems, uh, planetary systems have a Jupiter analog. So this may be important. Stephen, you have uh, four minutes. All right, so let's talk a little bit uh, uh, about Mars in this context, because uh, Mars is half the size of, uh, of Earth. And um, one of the important things when thinking about our planetary system is looking at the cases that are not habitable. And we're really lucky in that regard because we have Mars and we have Venus. Uh, Venus is a particularly interesting case that I could go on about, but I'm gonna talk about Mars for a moment. Mars is half the size of Earth. And when, when we uh, look at Mars and Earth, one of the important things is the differences in their atmospheres. Now, obviously they have very different composition. Uh, Mars has a predominantly carbon dioxide uh, atmosphere, which as I mentioned, Earth is able to, uh, efficiently remove the carbon from its atmosphere. But Mars also has these interesting tracer elements. Uh, it has krypton and it has xenon, and these can be used as traces of atmospheric loss. Now, the important thing about a Martian atmosphere for planetary habitability is that its, it's atmospheric mass is less than 1% of Earth's mass. It's extremely tenuous atmosphere. And when we look at, um, uh, the Martian atmosphere through time, this may not have always been the case. So the predictions based on what we understand about the loss of Mars's atmosphere is that there may have been periods very early on when the surface pressure may have been about half of Earth's current pressure. And that is enough to have surface liquid water on, this, on the surface. And as we know that there, there was surface liquid water, question is how long and what does this mean for, for planets in other systems? Uh, and um, I'm just going to briefly in my remaining minutes <laughs> talk, talk about that because this is extremely important for other planetary systems because we've already starting to see this through results from the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope is looking at planets around other stars, particularly around M dwarf, these small stars, which I mentioned, are extremely active and have a lot of flares. Now, if you put all these pieces I mentioned to you together, that means that uh, for, uh, for planets, especially small planets like Mars, they are very vulnerable to having their atmos atmospheres blown away by the, uh, by the, uh, the effects of, of the star. And so we see that with Mars and that's even more pronounced in other cases. And this is a, an example shown here from the famous TRAPPIST-1 system, which is a prime candidate for planetary habitability, but early results show that these planets do not have atmospheres. And that means that planetary habitability can be effectively ruled out for these planets, very important effect. So I'll just finish by, by mentioning with regards to uh, planets around other stars, 
We now know of more than 5,000 uh, planets. Uh, I looked up this morning and we're now up to almost 5,500 at this point. We crossed the 5,000 boundary a couple of years ago. Uh, and one of the good uh, new pieces of news from this is that small planets are far more common than giant planets. Uh, so there's loads of planets out there that are potential abodes for for planetary habitability and possibly life. We won't know until we look at them with more detail like we are currently doing with the James Webb Space Telescope. And in particular, we uh, look at their atmospheres, if they have an atmosphere, and look at specific features. And this is a, a summary diagram showing what kind of features that, that we would see on the Earth. We see signs of uh, photosynthesis, we've seen signs of volcanic activity, and then you see down the bottom, water vapor suggests habitability. If there are liquid water oceans, then that may produce clouds and water vapor that would uh, indicate that that is a potentially habitable environment. And so uh, I know I'm out of time, and so I'm, I'm going to finish by just putting up a slide uh, with a whole bunch of questions to think about. As I said, th this is a huge topic, and this is, as I say, an incomplete list of habitability questions. Uh, for example, one of the ones down the bottom here, does a substantial moon create a more habitable world? This gets back to the anthropic bias. Earth has a substantial moon, and it's a habitable world with life on it. Does that mean that a planet needs a substantial moon? That's important because having a substantial moon is not a given and in fact may be an extremely rare event. There are many other differences that you can think of, of just take Earth, but change things slightly on different axes and think about, does that make the planet less habitable or more habitable? And so these are the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer now uh, to understand what are the features? What are the various factors that make a planet more habitable or less habitable? And where are the boundaries? And that's, as I said, the important part about particularly Venus and Mars. They, sh they at least shed some light on where the boundaries of a habitable uh, environment is because we can look at both Mars and v Venus and say they are currently not habitable. Doesn't mean they never were. In fact, both Mars and Venus may have had habitable periods. Uh, but uh, it's something to think about looking at the boundaries of hab habitability. All right, I'm going to end there and, and take any questions that people might have. Thank you. Okay, um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, so much information, so important to um, a human mission to Mars. So a question from Elias. Would you say that we should look towards moons or planets for a potentially habitable area? That's a really great question. Uh, so it depends on if we're talking about inside or outside of our solar system, because there's a lot of, uh, um, I, I mentioned very briefly earlier about liquid water being present, uh, potentially in great abundance for the moons of our, our, our outer solar system. Uh, so subsurface oceans, whether they might be life, this is, of course, an extremely important question. Um, that is an important question, I would say, for, for astrobiology and life within the solar system. It's much more difficult for life outside of the solar system because um, one of the ways I sometimes put it is we, we often speculate about a subsurface ocean for Europa. Uh, we, we, we are actually speculating. I mean, we strongly suspect that there is some water in a liquid state. We're not sure of exactly what the phase of that uh, looks like, but that's in our own solar system. If we had a, a, a giant planet in another planetary system with a Europa, we would never know. We would never know. We certainly wouldn't know if that had life because moons uh, in other planetary systems are playing on hard mode. We're certainly not going to go there. Uh, to another planetary system and, and because we're having enough trouble doing that within our own system. So, so then the real question I think is, okay, so let's take Earth. If we made Earth a moon of Jupiter, so now we're talking about the common, it's commonly portrayed in science fiction. We see this in Avatar, for example. Uh, many, of the, uh, many of the Star Wars locations are moons, like the moon of Endor. Like it's a very common thing in science fiction. Let's take Earth and make it a moon. And 
the interesting thing there is that then you get an additional contribution to the energy balance because then you get the gravitational energy from the giant planet, which creates what we call tidal effects. And tidal effects is the squeezing of the moon due to the gravity of the giant planet. And we see that very obviously, for example, with Io, the innermost Galilean moon of Jupiter, which is constantly has volcanoes going off. Why? Because Jupiter's gravity is squeezing it. And so uh, the, that's one of the interesting things for me for, for having an, a, an Earth-sized moon. And so I, I think that could be really interesting because although I said that giant planets further out are pretty rare. Uh, my research has shown that giant planets actually closer to the star are pretty common. And so you could have an abundance of Earth-sized moons orbiting these giant planets, which are closer to their star. Uh, but I, I think that's a, a really, really interesting topic that is still very much in its infancy, I would say. Science fiction has been way ahead of us on this topic, like many things. <laughs> as they always are, right? Moving us forward. Um, great, great information. Um, Ahmed would like to know, speaking of volcanoes, is the existence of volcanoes evidence of the existence of water in the past? Oh, that, that's a really great question. Um, so possibly. <laughs> so it, this, is a, this is a very, very hot, topic, if you'll pardon the pun, very hot topic in, um, in planetary science at the moment, because earlier this year, uh, I was at a planetary science conference uh, in Houston, and it was announced at that meeting uh, that uh, a new evidence or, or a definitive evidence that Venus is vol currently volcanically active. We'd all, always suspected it, but we didn't have direct evidence of that just indirect evidence like sulfur in the atmosphere and things like that um and 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 this is very profound for venus because venus is the same size as earth uh and may have had a period as recently as a billion years ago when it had surface liquid water and so what does the uh the uh, current volcanism mean for that well it means that it's still active and that's extremely important because, uh, as I said, for Earth, the, the real trick the Earth has managed to pull off having surface liquid water, that narrow temperature range for 4 billion years, the more you think about that, the more profound it is. Because you think that is, think of all the possible temperature ranges and Earth managed to maintain that. Is that a coincidence or not? It's not a coincidence because Earth has physical processes that are temperature dependent such as the removal of carbon. And so, and that relies on the planet being geologically active. Plate tectonics does not work without geological activity and volcanism is definitely an indicator that the planet is geologically active. And so I would, the way I would say it is that volcanism is a necessary but insufficient criteria for past liquid water. You've got to have the geological activity to maintain surface liquid water. Good question. Wonderful. Um, Kal-El would like to know, when you were talking about how the sun is 30% brighter than it was at the beginning of the solar system, I was wondering how you discovered or measured this. Oh, that, that's a really great question. And it's something that, um, uh, well, so Stars are incredible. Stars are just so amazing because they represent so many areas of physics. Uh, we understand a lot about energy, a lot about gravity, a lot about nuclear physics. Uh, and they're all, all most areas of physics are represented in stars. And uh, they're also, once you understand the physics, uh, you actually are able to understand a lot of things uh, about stars. Um, and so since we've discovered that the energy output of stars originates from nuclear fusion reactions that turns hydrogen into helium. And that exactly made it, corresponds with the energy output of the sun when you do that calculation. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful how, how all of these uh, calculations for stars uh, are, are so greatly predict um, uh, what we observe for stars. And so 
what's happening uh, with this uh, conversion of hydrogen into helium is that the, 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 that means that the composition of stars is gradually changing with time. You're converting lighter elements into heavy elements. And that's something that we can also predict about how that changes the, the, the star with time. And so there's several different sources to, to answer your question. One is just from a physics point of view is that you can calculate the changing composition of the star and how the energy output of the star would change as you change the composition. That is quite a predictable, uh, predictable thing. But as with all science, you want to be able to test it. And so fortunately, um, oh, we have many, many, many stars that we can see, and we know their distances. And so we know their energy outputs. And in many cases, we can measure at least approximately their ages. We can also measure their compositions by taking a spectrum of them. And so we can test this. And so we can, uh, we can put all of these, all these different stars and plot them up on different axes. And we can see these correlations come out. We can see the dependency on energy output on the composition of the star, which is a direct result of the nuclear fusion reactions happening in, in the core. Uh, and, and so that's something that, um, that we see from other stars. When it comes to Earth, it actually can, can, can create some problems because if the sun was 30% less luminous, then it, it, uh, you start asking questions about, well, then was Earth in this massive uh, ice age? You know? <laughs> was it a lot colder? There are various solutions to that because you can have more greenhouse warming gases in the atmosphere, and that relates to the geology of the Earth when it was very young. Uh, and so, it, so by understanding the change in luminosity of the sun, you can understand the early history of the Earth as well. Good question. Wonderful. Um, I have a question about recurring slope linear. Do you think that is water or not water? Recurring slope linear. So on the sides of you know, the creator. Oh, 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 I was right. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Um, yes, but heavily mineralized is my understand. Yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, I mean, often the comparison is made to saline, but I, 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 I think that's kind of an, an approximate version of that. Um, and so this is, uh, this is water, which has been around for a long, long time. And, uh, an important piece of that, of course, is that the, the temperature dependence of the liquid state uh, depends on, on, on the mineralization of the water. And so uh, if you have saline or, or much more so, then, uh, then it can be liquid at different temperatures outside of the zero to 100 degrees, like below freezing. And so that can actually help. Uh, in, in this case, and that's why uh, we can still see that uh, evidence presently, is my understanding. Absolutely wonderful. And where would you go to find water if you went to Mars? I, I think I would be uh, digging quite a lot uh, in the preferentially in. So here's the interesting thing. So Northern Hemisphere is uh, low-lying compared to the Southern Hemisphere, generally. And there's been a lot of ideas put forward about whether that could have been a substantial uh, ocean in the past uh, or what was the scope of standing water on Mars in, in the past. Uh, and so previously, my, my preference would have been to to say, okay, I'll, I'll go to the Northern Hemisphere and we'll be digging around to see if there are reservoirs of water that still exist beneath the surface. But actually more recent re, uh, research, which is focusing more on the lake regions, which are in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, uh, lead me to think that maybe those would be the uh, best locations. So um, some of the low line regions in the Southern Hemisphere, I think would be my best. Bet. That's what I, I would put my money. Absolutely wonderful. Um, any other questions for Dr. King? If you have them, go ahead and put them in the chat. And I appreciate you being here so much. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, you, this will be recorded. Oh, uh, questions coming in from Tissia. 
what is the composition of lava on Mars? Oh, <laughs> that, that, that's a great question, which is outside of the scope of my expertise. Um, there's probably one of the other speakers who can answer that much better than I could. Uh, but yeah, good question. Awesome. But and, and I also want to say, if, if anybody uh, has any follow up questions, then uh, feel free to contact me out, outside of this workshop. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to get access to my book or have any trouble, if you don't already have access to it, then let me know and I can, I can give you access. Wonderful. If you want, um, you can email that to me and I can distribute it to the students. All right, great. Thank you so very much. And as far as the composition of lava, so all of the planets, all the rocky planets in the inner solar system have this iron and nickel core and some remnant um, fluid type rock that kind of bubbles up to the surface. So whatever the rocks, the minerals and the rocks are made of, and depending on where on the planet it is, um, that's what bubbles up and, and creates the lava. So it's just really melted rock. It could be, it could have metals in it. It could just be minerals, and quartz and things like that. Um, it's melted stuff from the interior of the planet. So that's my understanding. Um, next we have Lee Irons and Lee is a scientist and engineer. Lee conducts scientific research with application to space physics and planetary science in the scientific theories of ecological thermodynamics, network ecology, and human sustainability. Lee is also a power systems and environmental engineer with experience in power system design and production, hazardous environment decontamination, environmental remediation, and large-scale engineering and construction projects, including some of the largest ships or floating cities on Earth's oceans. You can find podcast interviews of Lee on the Space Show and on Space 3D. And today, Lee will be talking about sustainability in space and understanding the science behind human sustainable habitation on other planets. Welcome, Lee. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Nicole. Can you hear me fine? Perfect. Excellent. Okay, so the word sustainable is frequently used to describe mission and technology plans for space. However, sustainability is not well defined in the space industry, which makes the use of the term quite subjective. I'm going to teach you about the science of human sustainability and what it tells us about the possibility of sustaining human life in space. Specifically, we will look at human sustainability on Earth and then consider how that understanding might be extended to space. With this knowledge, you'll then be able to use sustainability objectively to, to design lower risk human missions to space. The things I will present might begin to sound like an anthropic bias of planetary habitability that Dr. Kane referred to. However, planetary habitability and human sustainability are different things. A planet could be habitable by humans, but unable to sustain humans in the way Earth sustains humans. A planet might be capable of sustaining an alien life form, but not have the capability to sustain Earth life. In this context, we will define human sustainability as the degree to which an ecosystem supports human life and human enterprise under nominal and potentially abnormal <clears throat> human activity in the course of expected and unplanned events. To understand sustainability, we need to learn about ecological thermodynamics theory. Ecological thermodynamics is a theory of how energy moves through Earth in such a way as to establish order while generating entropy, resulting in an Earth that is an island of order, far from thermodynamic equilibrium, surrounded by an expanding entropy of space. This involves non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which is different than the equilibrium thermodynamics that you might have learned about in high school physics and chemistry class. Let's get familiar with a few terms that we will be using. 
The basal ecosystem of Earth is the natural ecosystem in which humans evolved as hunter-gatherers. Once humans established agriculture about 10,000 years ago, they started creating what we will call an augmentational ecosystem made up of agriculture, technology, infrastructure, and human society. We will use the terms basal and augmentational in preference to the words natural and artificial to avoid implying that humans and all their technology are not a part of the evolved natural world. Humans and their technology, infrastructure, and society exist because of evolution, just as termites and their termite mounds exist because of evolution. Both the basal ecosystem and the augmentational ecosystem have three forms of growth. For the basal ecosystem, growth occurs as an increase in biomass of individuals and of populations, an increase in information in the form of the length of the DNA, and a growth of networks such as food webs. In the augmentational ecosystem, growth occurs in average human size and in population numbers due to the augmentational mass production of food. Growth of information occurs with increase in human knowledge and information technology, as well as increase in manufacturing process knowledge and automation technology. Growth occurs of organizational and institutional structures, communication networks, information networks, and human supply chain networks that move natural and produced resources to where they are needed. The Earth ecosphere evolved and grew in a manner that maximized three traits, self-restoring order, characterized by dissipative structures present in the pre-life Earth, capacity characterized by solar power pouring down on the surface area of Earth, and organization characterized by network vitality and functional diversity of the resulting living ecosystem. The basal growth forms enable the increase in self-restoring order and capacity of a basal ecosystem through the natural selection of the organization that moves the entire ecosystem further from thermodynamic equilibrium. The basal ecosystem provides the minimum human life support. Humans capitalize on access to basal energy sources within the ecosphere to augment human society above what is produced by the basal ecosphere. The self-restoring order, capacity, and organization of the basal ecosystem provides a fundamental basis for building and sustaining the capacity and organization of the human augmentational ecosystem. It helps to understand this as a system of energy production and flow, something ecologists and environmental engineers refer to as exergy. The beginning of the process are the dissipative structures, these are natural systems that are driven by the fundamental gravitational, electrical, and nuclear forces, forces that are called conservative by physicists. This means that they never wear out. Material in the sun and on Earth are captured in cycles of these conservative forces, which creates what are called dissipative structures that are constantly rebuilding themselves. These dissipative structures enable Earth to capture solar power and use it, making the overall system self-powering. With an effectively endless capacity of solar power, this means that the power never runs out. This power is then moved through the ecosphere in networks of dissipative structures that form ecosystems, with exergy passed from one link in the network to the next, being reused and repurposed as it moves. This network is an organization that is self-balancing, with the most efficient users of the exergy tending to be the most competitive and thus fittest for survival. This results in a self-balancing network that prevents a burnout of the network. Burnout is when a system ceases to function even when power is still available. Burnout is in an ecosystem appears as blight, extinction, and even cascade failure. Dissipative structures appear in the ecosphere in multiple forms. The power from the sun known as solar insulation is an indication of the dissipative structure of nuclear fusion that occurs in the sun and produces power that dissipates in the form of radiative heat. Once that power hits Earth, the combination of it with the physical conditions of material within the gravity well produces cycles in the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere. These cycles appear as plate tectonics and weather. The sun, Earth, moon gravitational system also produces a cycle of tides on Earth. These dissipative structures move water, air, and minerals through and around the earth, 
making them available for use. Dissipative structures also appear in the ecosphere as living things. Life utilizes biochemical and biophysical cycles that are driven by both the electrical reactions between atoms and molecules in chemistry, as well as by the force of gravity acting within the bodies of living things. These living things make up the biosphere portion of the ecosphere. The, the dissipative structures of the geophysical cycles and of biology meet in the soil of Earth to form the dissipative structures that are biogeochemical cycles, such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur cycles, to name some. You can learn more about the vital functions of soil at the session being presented later today by Morgan Irons. The basis of capacity of the Earth is the power of the sun striking the surface area of Earth. This is also power provided by the gravity well of Earth that drives the geophysical cycle of water, a major contributor to the power made available on Earth. Together, these two sources produce on average 334 watts per square meter made available all over the surface of Earth. This power sustains the basal ecosystem of Earth, including the fundamental life support of humans, powering all of the ecological services utilized by humans. You can learn more about these ecological services also from Morgan Irons later today. The contemporary humans of today, on average, utilize power from the basal ecosystem at 1900 watts per person, which is in average, which is in addition to the 334 watts per square meter that humans use in their field agriculture systems to mass produce food. This is based on total world human society energy consumption divided by the population of humans. This power is used to run the human augmentational ecosystem. Without the basal ecosystem, this power would not be available to humans. Without the basal ecosystem, humans would also not get the basic human life support from nature. They also would not have the raw materials available to generate raw power from biofuel to build fire, nor build technology to generate power from fossil fuels and nuclear fuel. All indications are that humans are also consuming and producing waste at a rate that challenges the sustainability of the basal ecosystem of Earth. Based on this, 60,500 square meters of Earth are needed to sustain each person with basal human life support. For the augmentational ecosystem, 4,600 square meters of Earth per person are used. The total area for needed for one person equates to a square that is 255 meters on one side. When one considers all of the natural resources utilized directly and or manufactured in varying quantities, at varying rates and into various goods by one modern day human, all of their activities, and that would have to be produced by this square, this number becomes reasonable by comparison. The power moves over and through the land area of Earth through networks of dissipative structures. When it comes to life, these networks are commonly known as food webs. Network ecologists who study these food webs have demonstrated empirically that they follow a set of network rules established by ecological thermodynamics theory. These rules result in a self-balancing dynamic. This self-balancing mitigates the risk that the network will burn out. We can summarize these rules under the headings of network vitality and functional diversity. Network vitality is a rule that establishes that 40% of the capacity made up of power and area is utilized by only a small portion of the network made up of anywhere from two to 4.5 effective trophic levels, trophic levels being the number of steps in a major food chain, with an effective connectivity of one to three, effective connectivity being the number of interconnected major food chains. This is referred to as a window of vitality. These major food chains make up what is called the ascendancy of the network. The food web in a given ecosystem is made up of possibly hundreds to thousands of interconnected food chains. The vast majority of these food chains comprise what is called the reserve of the network. The functional diversity rule establishes that 60% of the capacity of the ecosystem runs through these minor food chains. The network vitality and functional diversity revolt results in a stability, a self-balancing capability Network ecology defines ecological stability as the ability of an ecosystem to remain unchanged. 
If instability happens, the organization of the network then determines whether growth happens or decay happens. A disturbance is a phenomenon that acts to change an ecosystem. There is a difference between disturbances of a destructive nature that break networks and non-destructive disturbances that actually build the network or introduce changes in a non-destructive way. There are two types of disturbances. A load type is when any consumer in the network consumes at a rate that the network can accommodate without a complete loss of a resource or species. The result is that the increased consumption is spread out among all existing producers of the given resource as the network rebalances. A disruption type of disturbance results in the local depletion of a resource or the local extinction of a species. This could be a result of the consumption of a load consumer getting so excessive that it drives the producer into extinction, or it could happen as a result of a natural disaster such as fire, drought, plague, or pollution. There are two measures of stability that can be used for each of these types of disturbances. For loads, we use the stability properties of consistence and persistence. Consistence is the ability of a network to continue producing when a load changes. Persistence is the ability of a network to recover from a load change that causes production to drop. For disruptions, we use the stability properties of resistance and resilience. Resistance is the ability of a network to continue production when a disruption occurs. Resilience is the ability of a network to recover from a disruption that causes production to drop. Applying the concepts of network stability to network ecology, the purposes of network vitality and functional diversity become clearer. Network vitality ensures that the network is sufficiently robust to enable ecosystem consistence and persistence under loads. The one to three major network chains carrying 40% of the capacity ensure the network can handle load changes in a self-balancing way. Functional diversity ensures that the network is sufficiently reliable to enable ecosystem resistance and resilience when impacted by disruptions. The large number of minor network chains carrying 60% of the capacity ensure the network can handle disruptions in a self-balancing way. When combined, sustainability science and ecological thermodynamics theory give us a picture of how an ecosystem functions in a self-restoring, self-powering, and self-balancing way. As dissipative structures have maintained the ecosphere functioning continuously over millions of years, being self-powered by the capture of solar and geophysical power and raw materials in the gravity well of Earth, the self-balancing of networks of life ensures survival of the most efficient power users and growth even as disturbances occur. If the major food chains of a network grow too many in number as a result of increased consumption loading, competition for power and resources eliminates the least efficient of them moving the network back into the window of vitality. If the major food chains of a network grow too few in number as a result of disruption, the most efficient food chain in the reserve competitively takes over more of the power flow and resources and rises up to join the ascendancy of the network. This keeps the power balance between ascendancy and reserve at a 40-60% split. The augmentational ecosystem functions the same way. Network ecology rules become market rules for augmentational networks. They can be applied to any resource produced and consumed by humans within the market, within the markets of the augmentational ecosystem. Most markets tend to have one to three major producers and a number of minor producers. Network theory suggests that these markets are most stable when minor producers are many in number and have 60% of the market. It is these marketplaces that utilize the basal ecosystem of their raw materials and can be the result of overconsumption. One of the most important applications of these rules gets at the heart of human sustainability on Earth. The augmentational ecosystem must limit its market consumption of power and resources produced by the basal ecosystem. This limit is set by the window of vitality of the combined basal and augmentational networks. The augmentational power and resource consumption must be low enough so that it does not add to the number of major food chains or to the number of steps in these major food chains. This excessive consumption of humans would cause major food chains in the window of vitality to burn out, 
resulting in collapse. Whether or not it is a limited collapse or a full cascade failure depends upon how widespread the human excess consumption is across the ecosystem. These limits of the basal ecosystem can appear as market forces in the augmentational network that shift the balance of the network as we see on a daily basis in the marketplaces of Earth. Humans try to manage this balance by managing the market forces, but disturbances in the basal ecosystem frequently result of human access, of frequently a result of human excess, make a balance difficult to manage. Moving humans into space moves them away from this self-restoring, self-powering, self-balancing ecosystem that humans evolved in. The challenge is that there is no other place in the solar system that has one G of gravity and the same level of solar insulation as Earth. Humans could try to continue to get direct support from the basal ecosphere of Earth as they move away from Earth. The supply chain network that would bring these resources to, to humans, bring these resources to humans, is subject to the same network theory rules that the basal and augmentational ecosystems of Earth are subject to. Unless there are one to three major supply chains of spaceports, such as Kennedy Space Center, space shippers such as NASA, and space conveyors such as SpaceX, handling 40% of the supply volume, and many, many space supply chains handling 60% of the supply volume, then the space supply chain network will be brittle and subject to failure from excessive loads and disruptions. The further from Earth humans travel, the more risks there are for these disruptions. Humans will still need the same level of augmentational ecosystem consumption that they have evolved and adapted to on Earth, with the same level of life support and the same food technology infrastructure and society. If the current state of human civilization on Earth were to be placed in an ecosphere in space with lesser basal self-restoring order capacity and organization than is present on Earth, then it would be like expecting your household to run with a cell phone battery. Human civilization would decline to a level of ecosphere self-restoring order capacity and organization that is sustainable by the lesser basal ecosphere. Decline is a reversal of growth, biomass, information, and network in all of their forms. This leads us to our pan-cosmorio theory of human sustainability published in Frontiers in Astronomy and Space Sciences. I'll post the reference in the chat later. The consequence of the theory is that there are conditions from which human life has evolved. Such conditions are required to sustain human life at its current level of growth, and the availability of such conditions to humans defines the limit of their world. This theory uses the philosophical method of abduction to extend the ecological thermodynamics theory of Earth to space. There are two propositions of the theory. The first is the equivalent basal growth proposition that states basal life activity can be sustained in any space location that has self-restoring order, capacity, and organization equivalent to the basal ecosphere in which life evolved on its home planet. For humans, the base or settlement in space would need to be supported by natural ecosystems like those that humans evolved under on Earth. The second proposition is equivalent to, is the equivalent augmentational growth proposition that states augmentational life activity can be sustained in any space location that has basal growth equivalent to the home planet, as well as augmentational capacity and organization equivalent to society on the home planet. For humans, the base or settlement in space would need human infrastructure, technology, and society as on Earth that does not exceed the production capacity of the basal, basal ecosystem in a way that would pull it out of the window of vitality including augmentational power systems and in situ agricultural production and manufacturing capabilities for all utilized food and technology. The conditions that must be met are the same as on earth for sustainable basal and augmentational ecosystems. As part of the theory, we identify four levels of sustainability. Level one sustainability is the level of an advanced human society in space that has solved its human sustainability problems. This is the minimum recommended level for permanent human space bases and settlements that do not maintain a supply chain back to Earth. Level two sustainability is the level that provides humans with a familiar basal and augmentational environmental context that enables innovation and, adapta and adaptation with a minimal supply chain needed to replace depleted resources, 
extinct species and worn out or obsolete technology. Level three sustainability is only recommended as an early stage for a human space base or settlement that is supported by a settlement supply, supplemental supply chain that resupplies the location as needed while working on transitioning to a higher level of sustainability. Level four sustainability is only recommended for unstaffed robotic missions or for staffed missions that either take all of their needed supplies with them or maintain an umbilical supply chain from earth that provides regular supplies and emergency escape methods. Level four is ideal for missions within the orbit of earth. Short-term human missions beyond earth orbit can be done at this level, but with significant risk. Such risk can be mitigated by use of sustainability principles in the mission design. The different levels of sustainability result in varying capabilities of self-restoring, self-powering, and self-balancing, and thus introduce risk at less capable levels. There are five hypotheses provided with the theory that explain these risks. First four summarized in this table. These hypotheses are testable either by test platforms close to Earth or by the results of human missions, bases, and settlements as they migrate out into the solar system and experience unplanned events of loss of productivity, light, diversity, and cascade failure. You can read more about these levels of sustainability, the hypotheses, and how to test the hypotheses in the paper reference that I'll provide at the end of the talk. The fifth hypothesis is the Pan-Cosmario theorem hypothesis. This hypothesis with its theorem equation is used to determine minimum combinations of power from solar panels and power from non-solar power sources. This meets the basal stealth powering capacity needed to achieve and maintain the self-balancing organization necessary for level one sustainability at the distance a settlement is planned to be from the sun. It assumes Earth-like dissipative structures have been established for full self-restoring order. This equation can come in handy in mission design. So how does all of this apply to a Mars mission? The challenge with Mars, of course, is that it has about one third the gravity of Earth and a little less than half the solar insulation level of Earth. These two differences from Earth suggest that not even level three sustainability could be achieved. The Pan-Cosmario theory is based on the assumption that Earth life would not evolve quickly enough to the alien gravity and solar levels to produce self-restoring, self-powering, and self-balancing capability at levels that humans and human systems are evolved and adapted to. If the Pan-Cosmario theory is correct, there are two most likely possibilities. The first is that an attempted terraform of a basal ecosystem on Mars would either wear out run out of power or burn out quickly, requiring emergency support or escape. The second is that an attempted terraform would adapt to self-restoring, self-powering, and self-balancing levels that are unique to Mars that would be less than what humans and human systems are evolved and adapted to. In this latter case, humans on location who have no support from Earth would need to reduce their consumption and production to these lower levels or face forced production loss, blight, diversity loss, or cascade failure. In either case, this is what unsustainability looks like. It doesn't mean that humans cannot live and survive without earth conditions, but it does mean that humans and human systems are evolved, adapted, and tuned to earth conditions and would have to evolve and adapt to these different conditions. The question is whether they could evolve and adapt fast enough to survive. Levels one through three sustainability are based on the assumption that a permanent human presence at a given location in space is the objective. By permanent, this means multiple generations of humans are born on location and live their entire lives there, raising their own families. However, for a mission of limited duration with humans returning to Earth, this level of sustainability is not necessary. Level four sustainability is sufficient. However, the challenge with level four sustainability is that it is, it is high risk. It depends upon supplies and support from Earth. To reduce this risk, it is possible to use ecological thermodynamics principles to provide some elements of the self-restoring, self-powering, and self-balancing nature of the Earth ecosphere. This is where your selection of type of sustainability comes in. Strong sustainability would attempt to use a full Earth-like basal ecosystem. Weak sustainability would use 
all technology and balance sustainability would use both biology and technology combined in what is called eco-mimetic systems with technology helping to mimic ecological processes. In the presentation I will pro be providing on Thursday, I will talk about how to use ecological thermodynamics and the pan Cosmorio theory to select your level and type of sustainability and plan and engineer your mission to Mars. The presentation will give you tools to not only help you design a mission optimized for sustainability, but also be able to explain why your system is sustainable and why your competitor systems might not be as sustainable. So Nicole, I'm done. We might have a few minutes for questions. You all can also email questions to, to this email address. Okay, yes, the questions are coming in. Great, chock full of information. Um, Elias, um, please forgive me if I am mispronouncing your name, would like to know what other potential applications <clears throat> to these theories and hypotheses are there for a hypothetical mission to Mars besides the levels of sustainability? So the, the, the levels of sustainability uh, hint at what you're trying to do with, with your mission design. So when you look at the, at the conditions that are defined for basal ecosystems and augmentational ecosystems, we have in there things like, you gotta have similar dissipative structures on earth. So that means, you know, one G of gravity and it means the same level of solar insulation as, as you have on Earth. Um, it talks about um, the power conditions. So 343 watts per square meter to power a, a basal ecosystem and 1900 watts per person on average to, to power the human activities and the human habitation and, and things that humans do on a daily basis. It talks about area, the 60,500 square meters per person needed for just basic basal human life support when provided by natural earth ecosystems and and the 4600 square meters per person needed for augmentation eco uh, activities like agriculture and and manufacturing and habitation and and just all those human activities and then of course we talk about the network vitality and the functional diversity how how you set up the networks to, to be self-balancing. So, you know, from a basal ecosystem, the natural ecosphere, you would want to try and set it up the way you see things operating on earth, um, because you would expect that given all conditions equal, they're gonna operate the same way in, in, an, equivalent, in an equivalent place. Um, the, now it's interesting on, on the augmentational side when it comes to networks, this is really where, where mission design and the architecture of your mission design can, can become important. And like I said, I'll, I'll get into that more in, in my presentation on Thursday. But, you know, engineers frequently talk about having, having um, redundancy, right? Having a main line and having a redundant line. So if the main line fails, the redundant line can, can take up the load until you can fix the main line, right? Well, it turns out, uh, a, a sustainable network would not only have a main line and a redundant line, but would also have a bunch of reserve carrying 60% of the load. And reserve lines would be likely completely different systems that have different failure modes. And so if you're having problems with your, with your, main, uh, with your main production lines, like the, the things that are producing oxygen, your systems producing oxygen, and if you're having a common problem that is taking both your main and your redundant lines down, if those were the only things providing oxygen, you're in trouble. So uh, a, a stable, sustainable network would actually have 60% of your load being provided by alternative oxygen generating systems. Um, and so those are the kind of sustainable sustainability principles you could actually design into your mission systems your human life support systems and, and your other mission systems, communication systems and, and transportation systems and things like that to ensure that you don't, to ensure they're sustainable and which means that they're resilient, they're, they're, resist, they're 
they're, they're persistent under loads and they're resilient to disruption. Um, interestingly enough, we have an example of this on earth. A number of months ago, there was a day when at least in the US, and I think it was only in the US, almost all of the flights were grounded because something called uh, the NOTAM system that pilots use to prepare for their flights, both the main NOTAM, NOTAM system and the redundant NOTAM system went down at the same time. And that's because they were both dependent upon a single set of data and that data source had failed. And so as a result, pilots couldn't fly. So if there would have been a reserve system to provide that information that pilots could use outside of that main NOTAM system, then pilots could have continued to fly. So there's an example of where using, using network theory principles in designing your system could prevent you know, disruptions from taking down your system. Um, but all those conditions that I mentioned, those are all things that feed into what level of sustainability are you at? If, if you don't have the network stuff uh, completely organized so that you're self-balancing, you're gonna end up being at level two. If in addition to that, you don't have enough power or area, then that's gonna drop you down to level three. And then of course, if you don't have the dissipative structures present, like the, the, the gravitational levels and, and, and the earth life and the, the biogeochemical cycles going in the soil, that kind of thing, then you're effectively dropping down to level four sustainability. Thank you. Um, wonderful answer. How long until we get to the best level of sustainability? Let's say we launch to Mars next year. How long until we can get the best level of sustainability for humans on Mars? Yeah, so, so Mars is a difficult challenge because, you know, as I said, <clears throat> Mars could be habitable, which gets into the, the talk that Dr. Kane was talking about, but it's not necessarily sustainable for the way humans are, are evolved and adapted to living on Earth. So, and the reason for that is that fundamentally it doesn't have one G of gravity. And, and our human bodies are evolved and attuned to this one G of gravity and our autonomic systems in our body are actually based upon the weight that we feel on earth under one G of gravity. And that's why when, when astronauts go into space and they're in free fall, so they don't feel any weight, they begin to have problems with their eyesight and they begin to have problems with, with, with bone density and, and other physiological problems, immune system problems. These things begin to, to show up. And it's because partially that, that, that weight provided by one G of gravity is missing. You go to Mars, it's about one third. Uh, the gravity of Earth, so you'll, you'll weigh about one third the weight that you have here. And so theoretically, we don't expect the human body to function the same way on Mars. And the, and the question is, can the human body evolve and adapt within a generation or two to be able to uh, suit itself to that, to that one third gravity level? We're, we're concerned that long-term sustainability, in other words, establishing a full settlement on Mars that can be completely independent of Earth is gonna be difficult for one, because it might be difficult for humans to procreate on Mars, to have babies and raise families, just simply because of the physiological problems that humans have when they're in lower gravity and that might prevent them from being able to, to to gestate and, and have childbirth. Um, so that's a big problem right there that, that needs to be fixed before we can get to something what, that would be considered to be truly a level one sustainability capability on Mars. Does that mean that we can't go to Mars? No, it doesn't mean that, but it means that if humans go to Mars until we fix that problem, 
those humans probably aren't going to be able to procreate. And if, and if they want to have normal lifespans, they'll probably have to come back to earth frequently or have some other means of subjecting their bodies to full earth weight in order to restore their systems periodically. And those are technologies that people are thinking about and working on. Uh, so it's going to be a while, probably not in any of our lifetimes before we could see something that looks like permanent human settlement independent of Earth on Mars. It always makes me think of the line um, from the original Jurassic Park, life will find a way. <laughs> or life right. always finds a way. Well, well, sure, sure. But, but that's the key is that human life could find a way to live on Mars, but chances are, if, if you can't figure out how to make conditions on Mars exactly like they are on Earth, human life on Mars will stop looking like human life on Earth, which by our definition of human sustainability, it's not sustainable to the Earth model, but it's a different model of life. Adapting to the Martian right. environment. Right. Okay, so on one of your slides, you had balanced ecosystem, full earth versus full technology. Um, can you just briefly explain which, is, what are we shooting for in right. with your theories? Right. So, you know, ideally we can go anywhere in space and find things perfectly set up for us to live there and everything's happy. No work required. We just kind of move in and you know, hang our welcome sign on the door. Um, but, you know, there's nowhere in the solar system that we know of that has 1G Earth gravity and the same level of solar insulation as Earth, right? Um, so, and, and for that reason, when you try to take Earth life and put it there, that Earth life isn't going to necessarily function the same way and the ecosystems aren't necessarily gonna function the same way. So the earth life will have to evolve and adapt and it'll come to some of the different balances. As Nicole said, life finds a way, right? So the question is, can life find a way before it burns out, right? So it gets out of balance and, and dies off before it can procreate. So that, that's, that's the big challenge. So what we look at is, well, if, if we could take Earth, an Earth ecosystem and transplant it to Mars and boom, it just works. That's what we would call um, uh, the, the, uh, the full sustainability. Um, I momentarily lost the term in my head here. Excuse me for a second. That's what we call the, the strong sustainability. Thank you. Um, but some people say, eh, we don't need life. We're just going to tech our way all the way through space. It'll just be all technology. It's going to be like Star Trek. We have replicators and transporters and subspace communications and, and artificially generated gravity. And it's all generated by technology. And that's all we need. Um, so that's, that's what we would call weak sustainability. And then a balanced sustainability is like, oh, well, let's use elements of both. Let's use some technology. And then let's also use some natural ecosystem capabilities, some living things. We, we often call that those two things put together, we call that bioregenerative. So when you put biology and technology together to make the technology, to try and give the technology some capability to be self-restoring, if you will. Um, that's what we call balanced sustainability. And because the prospects aren't great for finding places with 1G of gravity and full solar insulation, um, and, and because ecological thermodynamics suggests that weak sustainability is not possible away from Earth, balanced sustainability is, is likely what, what we're going to need. And in fact, people that claim the use of weak sustainability on Earth for saying that society is great, we have weak sustainability, we don't need Earth's natural ecosystems, we can do fine just with technology. Well, they're cheating because they're breathing the air every day on Earth and 
They're drinking water that comes from ground systems that are being filtered by Earth. And, and they're using these resources that are produced naturally by Earth without even having to put out any effort themselves to use them. So weak sustainability doesn't even exist on Earth. Um, on Earth, we truly have strong sustainability. And, and we're risking that by, by overconsumption, as I'm sure all of you have talked about in, in some of your classes with, with the overconsumption that we have on Earth and climate change and that kind of thing. Wonderful. It's, it's good to hear um, the balance because I always wondered, how can we, the, in the Star Trek example, how do they do that? Aren't, don't they want a real hamburger? Right. <laughs> don't they? So the wonderful answer. Students, any other questions? I'd like to thank both of our speakers today. Um, students don't log off yet. I just wanna give you some information. Um, Thank you, Lee, and thank you, Stephen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for helping these students. Um, it is so much appreciated, and this will go up on YouTube in the next 24 to 48 hours. Great, thank you, Nicole. Great being here with you all. Thank you, the, the thank yous are coming in in the chat. Okay, um, students, I have, if you, are, if you are new to registration, I sent out a whole bunch of information, the syllabus, the rubric, there's also a link to fill out uh, a form just to say that you're going to um, work really hard and work with your team and do the best you can. So just fill out that Google form for me and make sure, please, please, please ask me any questions um, via email. I will be assigning mentors this week. Anything else, students? Just lots of thank yous, gentlemen, and um, really, really, really appreciate it. Okay, if there's nothing else, um, I will see you guys at 1.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time for Morgan Irons. And um, that's two hours from now. So whatever time zone you're on in two hours, I'll be back on the same Zoom with Morgan Irons. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.